very gratified uh, to be able to uh, to see so many familiar faces at uh, at this event and so many new faces as well. Uh, First Things Magazine is committed to being a voice for faith in the public square, and uh, we obviously do that primarily through the magazine and our website, but we also do it through events here in New York City, uh, where we can gather and hear from folks who have something interesting and important to say from the perspective um, of faith. And uh, and it's really my pleasure tonight to be able to host uh, Robert Riley, and uh, he's going to talk about his book, uh, Making Gay Okay. The current climate is such that um, uh, it's really his voice is not a voice that, uh, that people are willing to give a, a podium to. And um, I, I consider it an honor to be able to do that here, here tonight, to provide him with, um, with a podium to, to talk about, about this um, important issue that's really one of the defining issues of our time. For reasons that I would never have anticipated when I was a college student in the sort of afterglow of the 1960s, I always tell people the worst of the 60s was actually the 70s. And um, <laughs> it was hedonism without idealism. Uh, but nonetheless, even in, uh, in, in, my, my, um, in, my, in my youth, um, in, in the sort of bucolic, uh, um, heedless hedonism of uh, college life in the late 1970s, I don't think I could have imagined that our political and cultural life in America would come to revolve so relentlessly around the uh, issue of sex. Um, it's a very per- it's a perplexing to me. I've yet to really get my mind around why sex, and especially homosexuality, has become uh, the ultimate political issue of our time. Today, you can be a Democrat, and you can disagree with about tax policy. You can disagree about foreign policy. You can disagree about um, uh, reforming Social Security. You can disagree about many things, but you cannot disagree about abortion and same-sex marriage. There's something about the intimate life that has become a focal point in our time. Uh, I'm waiting for that essay to be submitted to First Things Magazine that illuminates for me uh, why, why, this, why this has happened. Why, why have we gone from uh, what it used to be the kind of classic social question, labor versus capital, or the classic political question, communism, foreign policy question, communism, versus um, freedom, uh, and we suddenly devolve down in our time to, um, to, the, to the sexual politics as the, as the ultimate politics. So much so that uh, we're fortunate that we don't live in a society where we have actual assassinations, but we do know that people are professionally assassinated um, for any kind of dissent on this issue. It's really quite striking, and I, like I say, I. I'm not sure I can get my mind around why we have come to this juncture, which is why I think um, Bob Rowley's book, Making Gay Okay, is um, really uh, such an important contribution to our thinking through why we got to where we are. Um, Well, I've gone on too long. Uh, Robert Riley is really known as a foreign policy guy and uh, served in the Reagan White House in that capacity. Uh, was the head of the Voice of America in the early aughts, and then subsequently served as a special assistant to the Secretary of, De- Secretary of Defense. Right? Is that right? Did I get that right? Close enough. Close enough. Um, uh, he didn't know it. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with Richard John Newhouse, I was a member of the, what, what was called the Advisory Council, and uh, um, the old joke was we pretended to give advice and he pretended to follow it. <laughs> well, we had, it was a Soviet s- system under Father Newhouse. <laughs> a benevolent dictatorship. Um, benevolent dictatorship. In any event, without any further ado, thank you so much for coming and please help me welcome Robert Riley. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Reno. It is an act of courage on your part to host me here, and I deeply appreciate it. And I thank you all for coming. I thank First Things for hosting this. Uh, I hope in a way that this book answers the question you asked, 
It's not an essay form. It required a book to do so. I'm going to begin tonight with two quotes. The first one is from a former Supreme Court justice. Perhaps more importantly, he signed the Declaration of Independence, and he also signed the Constitution, one of the few to do that. He's one of my favorite founders, James Wilson. Here is what James Wilson said about the family. Quote, it is the principle of the community. It is that seminary on which the commonwealth for its manners as well as for its numbers must ultimately depend. As its establishment is the source, so its happiness is the end of every institution of government which is wise and good. In order to be the source of every institution of government, the family must precede every institution of government. In short, marriage does not need government in order to exist. Government needs marriage in order to exist. So spake James Wilson in that very Aristotelian statement on the nature of the family. Fast forward to just a year ago, a little over a year ago, when Justice uh, Anthony Kennedy delivered himself in the Windsor decision of the following statement in which he invalidated the defense of marriage federal law defining marriage as between one man and one woman. This law was held to have no rational basis, no rational basis on which to exclude homosexuals from marriage. Quote, the federal statute is invalid for no legitimate purpose overcomes the purpose and effect to disparage and to injure those whom the state by its marriage laws, meaning this state, New York, sought to protect in personhood and dignity, unquote. <clears throat> no legitimate purpose. I don't know. I thought James Wilson came up with a pretty legitimate purpose and actually a, a rather rational basis on which to advance the family as understood as one man and one woman in a permanent relationship. So the, the question that uh, presents itself tonight is how did we get from there to here? Voila, the book. Now, in Claremont Graduate School, I studied with a great man, Harry V. Jaffa. He's 97 years old today. In a couple of months, I called him up. He's quoted several times in this book because in the 90s, he was courageous enough in the Claremont colleges to take on this question, which even then caused an enormous amount of controversy. Very weak, very feeble in voice, but still mentally completely alert. I had sent him a copy of the book, which he had trouble reading because of the size of the type, something I have against Ignatius Press. <laughs> but nonetheless, he said, Bob, this is just part of the damage from the triumph of history over nature. This man, the great defender of the Declaration of Independence and Abraham Lincoln, and knows of where he speaks, as he is one of the great defenders of nature, and he knows what the triumph of history over nature means. And what he means, I think, will become clear as I continue with these remarks. As I say in the introduction to this book, uh, the thesis is really very simple. There are two fundamental ways of looking at reality. Uh, one is teleological and Aristotelian, in the sense that things have a nature with an inbuilt purpose that lets us know uh, what the proper use of it is, what the end of it is, what its telos is. We don't get to make that up. It exists without our permission. Reality is here. What is, is here. Our job is to apprehend that reality, understand the laws of nature, and to conform our behavior with them if we are to become 
fully what we are supposed to be as human beings. As we can observe in nature around us, this happens with animals, it happens with any living thing, with the exception that they, of course, don't get to choose whether to conform to their natures. They have to by instinct. We, however, can decide that I don't think I'll conform uh, to my nature or the ends toward which I am directed by my very essence. I think I'll deny those and create an alternative reality. And that, indeed, is the second way of looking at the universe, which is the non-teleological way, or what I would call the anti-teleological way. And I use in this book uh, Aristotle to demonstrate the first view and Rousseau to demonstrate the latter view. And these pertain very clearly when it comes to the issue of marriage and to the proper use of our sexual powers in terms of human flourishing. Aristotle, as you will recall, begins the politics not with one man or with one individual in a state of nature somewhere, but with a man and a woman together in the family. The family, for Aristotle, is the pre-political institution without which no other institution exists. It's the basis of, first of all, villages, which are collections of families. And then the assortment of villages then constitute a polis, the existence of which is necessary for man to reach his full potential. So man is rational, he's social, he's political. When Aristotle looks at the family in the politics, he discerns that the principle of the family is chastity, the virtue which regulates the exclusive sexual relationship between the husband and the wife. Now, since chastity is the principle of the family, Aristotle also discerns that chastity is the political principle. Because anything that threatens the pre-political institution of the family on which the village and eventually the polis is based also threatens the existence of the polis. Therefore, when you read Aristotle, you come across these extremely energetic denunciations of adultery. And particularly strong ones, he said, if the husband uh, behaves adulterously when the wife is with child, that is particularly onerous and deserving of special stigma. But in any and all cases, he denounces adultery not only for moral reasons, but for the political reason that chastity is the political principle. Now, it never occurred to Aristotle, who says only a few words about sodomy, to have addressed the possibility of a homosexual family. And the reason it wouldn't have occurred to him is because it's a contradiction in terms as he sets them forth. Since an act of sodomy is in and of itself unchaste, how could it serve as the foundation for a family, the principle of which is chastity? So it would be a violation of the principle of non-contradiction. Something can't be its opposite. So he would never address even the possibility of such a thing. And since such so-called families were not generational, uh, with all the relationships of grandparents, fathers, children, it, would, it couldn't possibly be the foundation of a polis. So that is not present. Um, Aristotle, however, is very familiar with moral disorders, which he addresses in the ethics in a particularly brilliant fashion. How is it that all of us commit evil acts? What do we do when we commit those acts? Aristotle makes the point that by our nature as human beings, we cannot choose something that is evil unless we present it to ourselves as something that is good. We're constitutionally incapable of doing that. So what we do when we select an evil act is to rationalize it. 
to come up with a reconstitution of reality in which this act in this imaginary context really isn't stealing from someone, it's taking back what is our own, isn't really an act of adultery but an act of love, isn't whatever the particular moral disorder may be, Aristotle says, we rationalize it. Now, Aristotle also said something very interesting in the politics. He said revolutions are caused for reasons in people's private lives. So this, this is also true of cultural revolutions. They have as at their source reasons in people's personal lives. What might those be? Well, the key is going back to the process of rationalization. If, for instance, you should so choose to order your life on an evil act, let's say you'd like to be a professional thief or a hitman, or you'd like to have a sodomitical marriage, how are you going to do that? Well, the usual case when we do something evil is that we later come to understand our conscience intervenes. And we see we, that thing I did actually, that wasn't good. That was bad. And we repent. Uh, maybe we make restitution. Moral order is restored. Life continues. However, what if I choose that act as the centerpiece of my life? Then the rationalization I construct has to be more permanent. Only then will it allow me to continue the behavior I choose to center my life upon. So the distortion of reality, the alternate reality, the rationalization will be all-encompassing. It's the means by which you basically kill your conscience. Let's say you achieve that. You're a successful professional thief. doesn't bother you a whit there still remains a problem. There might be people all around you who tell you actually that's a profound moral evil in which you are engaged. In other words, their rebuke might set off the rebuke of your own conscience in accusing you of having chosen a life that is profoundly morally disordered. So in order for your rationalization to really be secure, you have to universalize it. You must get everyone to accept your rationalization that this particular bad is good. If not, there are potential sources of rebuke, which then might trigger your own conscience and bring, bring crashing down upon you all the guilt that you have suppressed from morally misbehaving in this way. That is what is at the heart and source of the cultural revolution. And as Dr. Reno said at the beginning, uh, this didn't start yesterday or in California. It began uh, at least in the 60s when heterosexuals decided to rationalize their sexual misbehavior in extramarital affairs, premarital affairs, pornography, or whatever other heterosexual disorder someone might wish to engage in. That rationalization began. And we saw that reflected in, we saw the acceptance of that rationalization in court orders that reflected its success in society. And the longest chapter in this book, by the way, is on how these rationalizations marched through the courts. Uh, and the, the key, of course, is contraception. If you want to have sex as a form of entertainment, you have to separate it from diapers. And the means by which you do that, of course, is contraception. So the first, the first case was um, was a Griswold versus Connecticut, in which the court ruled against Connecticut 
uh, and allowed contraceptives to be sold to married couples. The next step, well, if married couples have a right to contraceptives, what about unmarried adults? Do they have fewer human rights than married ones? Of course not. So any adult can obtain contraceptives. The next case, aren't minors human beings? How can you deny a minor a contraceptive? Indeed, those regulations were removed to the point today, of course, now minors have access to abortifacients. So next to the bubble gum, there's your abortifacient. Now, what if instance, uh, since we accepted contraceptive sex and the separation of sex from diapers, what if contraception fails and there's this unintended pregnancy. Well, it's not your fault, the contraceptive that Why should you be penalized with the life of this unborn child? Shouldn't you be allowed to eliminate it so you can continue the life which you have chosen to live in this particular way? Yes, says the court in Roe v. Wade. Of course you can eliminate the child. Well, what if uh, you're married and you're going to eliminate the child um, Shouldn't you have to tell your husband? Not ask his permission. That would be a violation of your human right. But not gain his consent. But don't you have to tell him you're going to kill the child? In the Casey case, oh, absolutely not. You don't have to do that. That might interfere with the abortion because the husband might try to save the child. Casey decision that was found unconstitutional. The husband's right in the fetus, they said, is less than the woman's right to her liberty. This decision was made in the Supreme Court under a freeze of Solomon, who found out who the true parent was, was the parent who was willing to forfeit the child in order to save its life. Now the true parent is the one who is willing to take the child's life. Solomon I love the Supreme Court when they make this ruling. Um, well, what a surprise then when we finally arrive at the case of sodomy. In the Bowers decision in 1986 or 87, the Supreme Court clearly said there is no constitutional right to the act of sodomy. You wouldn't think so. The 13 original colonies all had laws against sodomy. They had laws against sodomy at the time that the Bill of Rights was passed. All 50 states at one point had laws against sodomy. But 17 years later, in the Lawrence versus Texas case, once again under Justice Kennedy, the court reversed itself and discovered there is such a right. And one cannot demean uh, homosexuals by prosecuting them in such a law as Texas had in place, which had uh, uh, sodomy penalized as a mi minor, dis minor misdemeanor. Justice Kennedy said in that decision, uh, allowing this, permitting this, in no way implies that the government must approve it or uh, not, he didn't use the word bless it. But it was clear from the decision that, oh, oh yes, it did. Now, if there was nothing wrong with this, uh, why, why can't it be promoted and embraced by the government? And guess what? Ten years later, in the Windsor decision, just over a year ago, Justice Kennedy quotes himself from the Lawrence versus Texas decision and says, ha, yes, indeed, there is such a thing as a sodomitical marriage. And that the only reason, as I just read to you from the decision, uh, would, uh, there, there would be no rational reason to disparage such a relationship. So the logic is impeccable as it worked its way uh, through our society and through the court decisions that reflected the changes in our society. That's how the rationalization uh, grew. 
Now, the dynamic of this rationalization is very easy to understand. It's this. If you'll rationalize my sexual misbehavior, I'll rationalize your sexual misbehavior. Therefore, the sources of support for this disorder grow as that misbehavior grows in the unbelievable spread of pornography, in uh, the moral disorder in the heterosexual world it crosses over and they, of course, embrace that disorder in the homosexual world and you will find them both supporting abortion. Um, now, what, 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 what is the problem with this? What might we find out from an Aristotelian consideration of our sexual powers and how they ought to be used and what in our nature tells us what is an abuse of those powers. And I would say this is no harder to figure out than any other organ of our body, that our eyes are to see and our ears are to hear. Our eye has an inbuilt purpose to see. If we didn't understand that, there couldn't have been medicine developed to restore the sight of the eye if it is impaired in some way. By the way, if the eye is impaired in some way, it doesn't mean it's no longer an organ of sight, does it? If it's not seeing at the moment, if you're sleeping and your eyes are shut, is the essence of your eye still as an organ of sight? I think so, right? Same with your ear, the same with the other bodily organs, except when we get below the weight. What could these possibly be for? <laughs> Who knows? Who could think? Actually, it's not that hard to figure out with a stiff drink. <laughs> The essence of our sexual powers is clearly oriented in a unitive and procreative way. And those two purposes are inextricable. Obviously, the procreative purpose, the generative end of sex can't be met unless the unitive aspect is met. Now, there's all kinds of different kinds of love. There's love between two men, two women, sisterly love, brotherly love, parental love, adventurer love. As you know from the Socratic <coughs> dialogues, male love is particularly praised as one of the greatest things in life. However, nowhere will you find a more energetic condemnation of sodomy than in Socrates and in Plato. While they praise male love, they say it is inappropriate to sexualize that love. And by so doing it, you short circuit the thing at which Eros is aimed, which is the ultimate beauty, the ultimate, which resides in the ultimate good. Sexualize it, you short circuit it. And therefore, it, it won't achieve its end and it will bring harm to the people engaged in it. Therefore, when we examine various uh, contemplated uses of our sexual powers in the relationship, we could ask ourselves will it be unitive? Are the sexual organs complementary, or the pieces don't fit? Will it be potentially procreative? Well, if it's not unitive, so it can't be procreative. And if the pieces don't fit, it won't be unitive. That is nature's way of letting us know that such love is not spousal. As spousal love is the only form of love 
which appropriately receives its expression in sexual acts, because it's both complementary and unitive, and it's also procreative. Therefore, the use of our sexual powers outside of those purposes is clearly a misuse of them. It makes us, therefore, it not only uh, abuses those, in fact, it makes us ultimately less human. We will, we will not flourish as human beings. We will not meet our ultimate end if we so abuse these faculties. Now, where does history enter in? This was, by the way, I, I make a point in this book of saying there will be nothing of religion, there will be nothing from revelation in this book. One reason for that is clearly that um, quoting from scripture does not work in the public square anymore, as Father John Newhouse would know why better than anyone. Uh, you'll immediately be eliminated from the conversation. Oh, you're a Christian, go ahead, run along to your church or home. I have no business here in the public square because I don't happen to be one. Or I don't believe that form of Christianity. So I don't mention religion at all in this book. For that reason, and make it very clear, however, that through our reason we can come to understand the difference between the natural use of something and its unnatural use. And that you cannot claim a natural right for an unnatural act. It's logically inconsistent. If you accept nature as the authority, and here arises the problem, and I used, <clears throat> tell me if I'm going on too long. Okay, I'll give you some All right, well, we can wrap up very well because we're living in history, unfortunately. <laughs> As we know, uh, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, upended Aristotle and uh, denied that nature was teleological. He said it was non-teleological. Man, nature is not an end. Or in the 20th century, John Dewey said, man's nature is to have no nature. So he had to make it up. Or as your famous, your favorite French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre said, existence precedes essence. So you, you exist before you have a nature, and therefore you courageously make up your own nature. Uh, according to So Rousseau begins not with a family, a husband and a wife, but an isolated individual in the state of nature who is free rational and asocial and non political. The obverse of Aristotle's description of man. Man is not a rational animal, he's free rational, he's not a social being, he is asocial and he's not political. But, however, the great advantage, Rousseau told us, was that man in this state of nature was completely happy because the sentiment of his own existence was sufficient to himself. And the only thing that jarred him out of the state of contentment was, guess what? Another man! It was society that ruined the state of nature. As far as the family was concerned, the family is not natural. That in the state of nature, a man would uh, happen across a woman in the forest, and just out of the sheer force of physical desire, they would copulate. He would leave. He had absolutely no interest in the woman. And the woman had absolutely no interest in the child, so she would abandon it as soon as she could. In the 18th century in France, people were so impressed by this, though, certain aristocrats took their children to the forest and let them loose, thinking, oh, this is much better for them than raising them at home. I'm kidding. Uh, now, uh, the, 
the prescription. So, so for Rousseau, that man had to start thinking then, because he's in association with other people, and all of a sudden he's alienated from himself because he starts living in the opinions of others. And uh, this horrible thing, government and society, develops in families. Rousseau's project is, he knows that, like the fall and like original sin, uh, this can't be recovered from, but he can reach a, a simulacrum of the original state of happiness by destroying all of the subsidiary relationships in life and leaves the man uh, related to the state alone. So the only relationship for you would be between you and the state and all the subsidiary relationships which alienate you from yourself will be eliminated. And of course, the family is that primary source of alienation. So Rousseau wants to take from parents the, um, the education of their children and the authority of the father. But dad, don't worry. Your child is still your fellow citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so Rousseau doesn't speak specifically about homosexuality and he sprinkled his children uh, across orphanages in France and Switzerland, of course. He abandoned them all. Uh, but it is his virulently anti-teleological view of man which has led us here. Because he said society and the family <coughs> is a product of accident, not of nature. not according to nature, but nature as he understands it, meaning everything is the product of the a accident because you, you, it's your nature, it's a heavenly nature. Since everything is then artificial, guess what? It can be changed. By what? The state. Therefore, if you want to redefine the family, as long as you have the will and power to do so, uh, you, you may. Uh, because there's no nature you would offend. That's why in some of these debates about homosexuality, uh, people will say, oh, well, that's old hat, or you know, that's on the ash heap of history, or times have changed. All of this is Rousseauian in the sense that we are made by history, not by nature. We are products of this history. And those, of course, who can get control of the levers of history can, can change, can change us, can change man. Our nature is not immutable. And uh, so long as this view obtains, uh, there could not possibly be any objection to sodomitical behavior or to marriage based upon it. So if Rousseau is right, there, goes, there really isn't any problem with However, if Aristotle is right, and actually we have an immutable nature with inbuilt purposes in ourselves and a good toward which all our souls are directed, well, then there is a problem. Then there's a really big problem. And this, of course, has tremendous political repercussions. When we say we are all human beings, and we recognize another person that's a human being, souls are all ordered to the same good. There's not a separate good for a Greek and another good for a Spaniard. Well, my wife is Spanish, and sometimes I wonder if that makes <laughs> <laughs> You know, this was the great Socratic discovery, that Virginian speech, that there's only, there's not one, there's not a Spartan justice and an Athenian justice, there's only one justice that's universal common wealth, of common weal, of community. And once you say that no longer exists because that immutable nature with its inbuilt purposes doesn't exist, what then becomes the basis for order, for, for any political order? I'll 
give you a little hint from the Gorgias. When Callicles is speaking to Socrates, He says to Socrates, quote, he who would live rightly should let his desires be as strong as possible and not chasten them, and should be able to minister to them when they are at their height by reason of his manliness and intelligence, and satisfy each appetite in turn with what it desires, unquote. The strong man. And Callicles goes on later in the dialogue make clear that he agrees with Prosimachus's famous statement from the Republic that right is the rule of the strongest. Nothing is inherently right or wrong. It's the strongest who gets to say what's right. Therefore, right is the rule of the strongest. A statement, I don't know whether Hitler ever read Socrates, but he repeated that statement exactly when he had felt that right is the rule of the strongest. And he was the strongest. And that's the problem. You remove the basis of, of commonwealth, common wheel of community, uh, leaving people to be ruled by their passions. And the person who gets to satisfy his passions the most is the strongest person who will suborn others to that. Reason, under Aristotle and the Aristotelian vision uh, of nature, you have the primacy of reason which then apprehends the order of nature, and by conforming yourself to the purposes inherent in that nature, you lead a life of virtue which leads you to happiness. Right? Um, once that is undermined and absent, you have the primacy of will. Rousseau went to stay with David Hume in England, Rousseau is famous, of course, for saying, Hume is famous for saying that the only use of reason is to serve your passions. That's what reason is for. It's to find the most efficient way for you to satisfy your passions. It's not the Aristotelian view that reason is there to rule your passions so you live to live a life of virtue and, and therefore of happiness and meet your ultimate aim, your telos as a human being. Um, it's not very hard to see what the political consequences of this are and where it ends up. Uh, and I'm uh, sorry to say that is the path on which we are. And as this rationalization of this moral disorder has now reached the stage of enforcement in our society, uh, through the levers of government and the courts and the executive branch. As you know, people who won't participate in so-called homosexual marriages as florists or caterers or so forth have been prosecuted and penalized. And uh, speaking out uh, about this, as, as Dr. Reno said, is becoming a, a rather perilous task because complicity will be enforced. Complicity is necessary for the universalization of the rationalization. But that complicity, of course, comes at a certain price uh, in our own souls if we agree to it. What difference does it make? How many homosexuals, you know, what's, what, two, three percent of the population? Then say a very tiny percentage of those homosexuals will actually get married, as the evidence from the Netherlands and Canada has shown so far over the past 15 years. So why why do they push so hard for it? As I try to demonstrate, homosexual marriage is the ultimate in the rationalization because it's the sanctification of sodomy, and therefore it completes that rationalization. But if it's such a small portion of the population, so few people engage in it, why, why would that matter? I would say it matters analogously uh, as would introducing a counterfeit currency into the currency. 
you know, why, why should that bother you if there are a few people with uh, printing presses cranking out phony U.S. dollars? Any problem? Yeah, it's a value to your currency. It's a phony currency. It's not a real currency. It's an ersatz currency. <clears throat> Just as the acceptance of this, of course, devalues real marriage, confuses people as to what marriage is. And the larger thing I'm pointing to is the problem with your view of reality from which this comes. That's the real danger. And the acceptance of homosexual marriage means the acceptance of that view of reality. And as I tried to point out, that has consequences far beyond this particular issue. Did I stop there and take a question? You don't want me to stop there?